Felipe of Sigurd from the Red Fairy Book. Once upon a time, there was a king in the north who had won many wars, but now he was old. Yet he took a new wife, and then another prince who wanted to have married her came up against him with a great army. The old king went out and fought bravely, but at last his sword broke, and he was wounded, and his men fled. But in the night, when the battle was over, his young wife came out and searched for him among the slain, and at last she found him, and asked him whether he might be healed. But he said, No, his luck was gone. His sword was broken. He must die. Proper Viking. And he told her that she would have a son, and that son would be a great warrior, and would avenge him on the other king, his enemy. He bade her keep the broken pieces of the sword, and to make new the sword for his son. And that blade shall be called... Grab. And then he died. As his wife called her maid to her, she said, Let us change clothes, and you shall be called by name, and I be yours, lest the enemy finds us. So this was done, and they hid in the wood. But there are some strangers met them, and carried them off to a ship to Denmark. And when they were brought before the king, he thought the maid looked like a queen, and the maid and the queen like a maid. So he asked the queen, How do you know in the dark of night whether the hours are wearing in the morning? And she said, I know because when I was younger, I used to have to rise and light the fires, and I still awaken at the same time. A strange queen to light the fires, thought the king. Then he asked the queen, who dressed like a maid, How do you know in the dark of night whether the hours are wearing near dawn? My father gave me a gold ring, she said, and always, ere the dawning, it grows cold on my finger. Interesting. A rich house where maids wear gold, said the king. Surely you are no maid, but a king's daughter. So he treated her royally, and... As time went on, she had a son called Sigurd, a beautiful boy, and very strong. He had a tutor to be with him, and once the tutor bade him to go to the king and ask for a horse. Choose a horse for yourself, said the king, and Sigurd went into the wood. And there he met an old man with a white beard, and said, Come and help me in horse-choosing. Then the old man said, Drive all the horses into the river. Choose the one that swims across. So Sigurd drove them, and only one swam across. Sigurd chose him. His name was Grani, and he came from Sleipnir's breed, and was the best horse in the world, for Sleipnir was the horse of Odin, the god of the north, and was as swift as the wind. But a day or two later his tutor said to Sigurd, There is a great treasure of gold hidden not far from here. It would become you to win it. But Sigurd answered, I have heard stories of this treasure, and I know that a dragon 
Fafnir guards it, and he is so huge and wicked that no man dares to go near him. He's no bigger than other dragons, <laughs> said the tutor, and if you were to be as brave as your father, you would not fear him. I'm no coward, said Sigurd. Why do you want me to fight with this dragon? Then his tutor, whose name was Regan, told him that all his great hoard of red gold had once belonged to his own father. And his father had three sons. The first was Fafnir the dragon. The second was Otter, who could put on the shape of an otter when he liked. Okay. And the next him was himself, Regan. And he was a great smith and maker of swords. Now, <clears throat> there was at this time a dwarf called Anvari, who lived in a pool beneath the waterfall. And there he had hidden a great hoard of gold. And one day Otter had been fishing there, and had killed a salmon and eaten it, and was sleeping, like an otter, on a stone. Then someone came by and threw a stone at the otter and killed it, and flayed off his skin and took it to the house of Otter's father. Then he knew his son was dead, and to punish the person who had killed him, he said he must have the otter's skin frilled with gold and covered all over with red gold, or it should go worse for him. Then the person who had killed Otter went down and brought the dwarf who owned all the treasure and took it from him. <sighs> Only one ring was left the dwarf, dwarf wore, and even that was taken from him. Then the poor dwarf was very angry, and he prayed that the gold might never bring any bad luck to all the men who might own it forever. Oh, anything, bring anything but bad luck. Anything but bad luck makes more sense for others. Then the otter skin was filled with gold and covered with gold, all but one hair. And that was covered with the poor dwarf's last ring. But it brought good luck to nobody. First Fafnir the dragon killed his own father, and then he went and wallowed on the gold, and would let his brother have none, and no man dared go near when Sigurd heard the story, he said to Regan, Make me a good sword that I may kill this dragon. So Regan made a sword, and Sigurd tried it with a blow of a lump of iron. And the sword broke. Another sword he made, and Sigurd broke it too. Then Sigurd went to his mother and asked for the broken pieces of his father's blade and gave them to Regan. And he hammered and wrought them into a new sword, so sharp that fire seemed to burn along its edges. Sigurd tried this blade on the lump of iron, and it did not break, but split the iron in two. Then he threw a lock of wool into the river. And when it floated down against the sword, it was cut into two pieces. So Sigurd said, the sword would do. <laughs> but before he went into, against the dragon, he led an army to fight the men who had killed his father. And slew their king, and took all their wealth, and went home. When he had been at home a few days, he rode out with Regan one morning to the heath where the dragon used to lie. Then he saw the track which the dragon made when he went to the cliff to drink. And the track was as if a great river had rolled along and left a deep valley. 
When Sigurd went down into that deep place and dug many pits into it, and in one of the pits he lay hidden with his sword drawn. There he waited, and presently the earth began to shake with the weight of the dragon as he crawled to the water. And a cloud of venom flew before him as he snorted and roared, so that it would have been death to stand before him. But Sigurd waited till half of him had crawled over the pit. Then he thrust the sword Gram right into his very heart. The dragon lashed with his tail till stones broke and trees crashed about him. And then he spoke as he died and said, Whoever thou art has slain me, this gold shall be thy ruin, and ruin of all who own it. Sigurd said, I would touch none of it by losing it, should I never die. But all men die, and no brave man lets death frighten him from his desire. Die thou, Fafnir. And then Fafnir died. And after that, Sigurd was called Fafnir's Bane and Dragon Slayer. Those titles are quite literal. Then Sigurd rode back and met Regan, and Regan asked him to roast Fafnir's heart and let him taste it. Roast dragon heart. Does not taste it? So Sigurd put the heart of Fafnir on a stake and roasted it. But it chanced that he touched it with his finger and it burned him. No kidding. Then he put his finger in his mouth, and so tasted the heart of Fafnir. Then immediately he understood the language of birds, and he heard a woodpecker say, <laughs> There is Sigurd roasting Fafnir's heart for another, when he should taste it of himself and learn all wisdom. The next bird said, There lies Regan, ready to betray Sigurd, who trusts him. The third bird said, Let him cut off Regan's head and keep all the gold to himself. The fourth bird said, Let him do, and then ride to Heimfell, to the place where Brynhild sleeps. When Sigurd heard all of this, and how Regan was plotting to betray him, he cut off Regan's head with one blow of the sword Gram. Then all the birds broke out singing. <sighs> you just prepare your earplugs. We know a fair maid, a fair maiden sleeping. Sigurd, be not afraid. Sigurd, win the maid. Fortune is keeping. High over Hanfield, red fire is flaming. There doth a maiden dwell. She that should love thee well. Meet for thy taming. <clears throat> there must she sleep till thou comest for her, her waking. Rise up and ride for now. Sure she will swear the vow. Fearless are her breaking. <clears throat> uh, 
When Sigurd remembered how the story went that somewhere far away there was a beautiful lady enchanted, she was under a spell so that she must always sleep in a castle surrounded by flaming fire. There she must sleep forever till there came a knight who would ride through the fire and awaken her. There he determined to go, but first he rode right down to the horrible trail of Fafnir. And Fafnir had lived in a cave with iron doors. The cave dug deep down in the earth, and full of gold bracelets and crowns and rings. And there, too, Sigurd found the Helm of Dread, a golden helmet, and whoever wears it is invisible. And all these he piled on the back of the good horse Grani, and then he rode off, rode south to Hendfell. Now it was night, and on the crest of the hill Sigurd saw that red fire blazing up in the sky, and within the flame a castle, and a banner on the topmost tower. There he set the horse Grani at the fire. And he leapt through it lightly, as if it had been through a heather. So Sigurd went into the castle, and there he saw someone sleeping, clad all in armor. Then he took the helmet off of the head of the sleeper, and behold, she was the most beautiful lady. And she wakened and said, Ah! <gasps> It is Sigurd, Sigmund's son, who has broken the curse and come here to waken me at last. The curse had come upon her when the thorn of the sleep, tree of sleep ran into her hand long ago for punishment because she had displeased Odin the god. Long ago, too, she had vowed to never marry a man who knew fear and dared not ride through the fence of flaming fire. For she was a warrior maid herself, clearly, and went armed into battle like a man. But now she and Sigurd loved each other, and promised to be true to each other, and he gave her a ring, and it was the last ring taken from the dwarf Advari. Then Sigurd rode away and came to the house of the king, who had a fair daughter, her name was Gudrun, and her mother was a witch. Now Gudrun fell in love with Sigurd, but he was always talking of Brynhild, how beautiful she was, and how dear. So one day Gudrun's witch mother, but poppy and forgetful drugs in a magical cup, and made Sigurd drink to her health, and he drank. And instantly he forgot poor Brynhild, and he loved Gudrun. And they were married with great rejoicings. Now the witch, the mother of Gudrun, wanted her son Gunnar to marry Brynhild. And she bade him to ride with Sigurd and go and woo her. So forth they rode to her father's house, for Brynhild had quite gone out of Sigurd's mind by reason of the witch's wine. But she remembered him and loved him still. Then Brynhild's father told Gunnar that she would marry none but him who could ride through flame in front of her enchanted tower. And thither they rode, and Gunnar set his horse at the flame, but he would not face it. Then Gunnar tried Sigurd's horse, Granny, but he would not move with Gunnar on his back. Then Gunnar remembered witchcraft that his mother had taught him, and by his magic he made Sigurd look exactly like himself, and he looked exactly like Gunnar. Then Sigurd, in the shape of Gunnar, and in his mail, mounted on Granny, and Granny leaped the fence of fire, and Sigurd went in and found Brynhold. But he did not remember her yet, because of the forgetful medicine in the cup of the witch's wine. Now Brynhold had no help but the promise she would be his wife, and the wife of Gunnar as she supposed, for Sigurd wore Gunnar's shape. And she had sworn to wed whoever rode in the flames. And he gave her a ring, 
and she gave him back the ring he had given her before, in his own shape as Sigurd. And it was the last ring of the poor dwarf Adivari. They're making a point of that. Then he rode out again, and he and Gunnar changed shapes, and each was himself again. Then they went home to the witch queens, and Sigurd gave her the dwarf's ring, or gave the dwarf's, wing to, the dwarf's ring to his wife, Gudrun. And Brynhild went to her father and said that the king had come called Gunnar and had ridden the fire, and she must marry him. Yet... I thought, she said, that no man could have done this deed but Sigurd, Fafner's bane, who is my true love. But he has forgotten me, and my promise I must keep. So Gunnar and Brynhild were married, though it was not Gunnar, but Signar in Gunnar's shape, that had ridden the fire. And when the wedding was over, and they all had feasts, then the magic of the witch's wine went out of Sigmund's brain, and he remembered all. He remembered how he had freed Brynhold from the spell, and how she was his own true love, and how he had forgotten and had married another woman, and won Brynhold to be the wife of another man. But he was brave, and he spoke not a word of it, for the others to make them unhappy. He still could not keep away the curse which was to come on everyone who owned the treasure of the dwarf Advari, and his fatal gold ring. And the curse soon came upon all of them, for one day when Brynhold and Gudrun were bathing, Brynhold waded farthest out into the river, and said she had to show she was Gudrun's superior. For her husband, she had, had said, had ridden through the flame when no other man dared face it. Then Gudrun was very angry, and said it was Sigurd, not Gunnar, who had ridden the flame, and had received from Brynhold the fatal ring, the ring of the dwarf and Andvari. Then Brynhold saw the ring which Sigurd had given Gudrun, and knew it, and knew all. <laughs> and she turned as pale as a dead woman, and went home. All that evening she never spoke. Next day she told Gunnar, her husband, that he was a coward and a liar, and he had never ridden through the flame, and had sent Sigurd to do it for him, and pretended that he had done it himself. And she said she would never see her glad in his hall, never drinking wine, never playing chess, never embroidering with a golden thread, never speaking words of kindness. And then she rent all of her needlework asunder and wept aloud, so that everyone in the house heard her, for her heart was broken, and her pride was broken in the same hour. She had lost her true love, Sigurd, the slayer of Fafnir, and she was married to a man who was a liar. Then Sigurd came and tried to comfort her, but she would not listen, and said she wished the sword stood fast in his heart. Not long to wait, he said, till the bitter sword stands fast in my heart, and thou will not live long when I am dead. But, my dear Brynhild, live and be comforted, and love Gunnar thy husband, and I will give all the gold and treasures of the dragon Fafnir. Brynhild said, It is too late. Then Sigurd was so grieved, and his heart so swelled in his breast, that it burst the steel rings of his shirt of mail.
That can't be helped. Sigurd went out, and Brynhild determined to slay him. She mixed serpent vism and wolf's flesh, and gave them in one dish to her husband's younger brother. And when he had tasted them, he was mad. And he went into Sigurd's chamber while he slept, and pinned him to the bed with a sword. But Sigurd woke, and caught the sword Gram into his hand, and threw it at the man as he fled, and the sword cut him in twain. Thus died Sigurd, Fafnisbane, whom no ten men could have slain in fair fight. Then Gudrun wakened and saw him dead, and she moaned aloud, and Brynhild heard her and laughed. Then the kind horse Granny lay down and died of very grief. And then Brynhild fell weeping till her heart broke. So they attired Sigurd in all his golden armor, and built a great pile of wood on board his ship, and at night laid him in its the dead Sigurd, and the dead Brynhold, and the good horse Granny, and set fire to it, and launched the ship. And the wind bore it blazing out to sea, flaming into the dark. So there were Sigurd and Brynhild burned together, and the curse of the dwarf and the Vari fulfilled.